Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I have something of a response video to The Critical Drinker. Before I get into it, though, I should say, uh, first and foremost, I have nothing but respect for The Critical Drinker. He is uh, he's one of my favorite YouTubers, has been for quite some time. Uh, I think he is incredibly insightful and manages to put a lot of uh, a lot of complex topics into very concise uh, concise explorations. And not to mention the fact that he can just be downright inspirational uh, in a lot of his uh, in a lot of his videos and a lot of his analyses, especially of the importance of media. And so I don't think that we should uh, we should discount or disrespect his contributions. That said, I think uh, that he has made a bit of an error here. Of course, it's a common error. Uh, it's an error that a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of people in this sort of media criticism sphere have made, and it's also, I think, something that we need to point out, and that as a philosopher, I'm pretty equipped to point out. Uh, and we'll find this error, or at least what I what I uh, criticize as an error, in his video on wokeness. The point I'm making here is that incorporating progressive themes and ideas into entertainment is no different than incorporating traditional conservative themes and ideas. They're both just perspectives that the audience is invited to consider. But for me, the tipping point comes when those themes and ideas to be explored turn into messages to be broadcast. That's where they start to undermine the integrity of the story and characters, making them behave in ways that don't feel natural, believable, or consistent with what we know about them. What really matters is how all of this stuff is implemented, the intention behind it, how well it integrates into the narrative, whether it enhances and complements or undermines your investment in the story. That's what's actually important to any piece of entertainment, and if you start dismissing and shitting on stuff simply for what it contains, rather than how it's been put together, then all you're doing is undermining and discrediting legitimate criticism. So we see here a criticism of wokeness, not as an object, not as an end, but as a means. The way that it's done, rather than what it's doing. Uh, this is parallel to some of the other things that I've spoken about in some of my classroom lectures recently. Uh, if you haven't been follow along, following along, uh, you'll find links to some of those in the description below that go over uh, some of uh, this book. This is Ethica to Mystica by Ralph McInerney. Uh, this goes into the distinction between how we can criticize ends and how we can criticize means. So he uses a brilliant, uh, brilliant example, I think, uh, where we can, in fact, obviously, we all agree that we can criticize someone's means. If someone is trying to do something and trying to do so ineffectually, we can obviously criticize that because that is exactly the sort of thing that, uh, that the drinker is criticizing and that a lot of cultural critics uh, point out that woke media does poorly. It tries to put forward a message, or the message, um, but it does so in a in a ham-fisted, awkward sort of way, rather than uh, in a an effective way or in a uh, in a, in a way with literary merit. Now, this is perfectly legitimate criticism. I can't deny that. However, I think that we have to be able to go a step further than this and not merely stop with criticizing the means and also criticize the ends of what's going on. So I want to I want to give us an example here uh, from McInerney, uh, which he puts forward uh, absolutely brilliantly. Uh, he's a master, I will say, uh, of uh, uh, of memorable and vivid examples. So <clears throat> he says, let us say that you come upon me seated at table. Before me is a heaping bowl of carpet tacks. I pour low-fat milk over them, sprinkle them with a sugar substitute, and bring a spoonful towards my mouth. Or rad, as they say in crossword puzzles, you give a cry and stay my hand. Why would you want to eat carpet tacks, you reasonably inquire? I've been told that I need more iron in my diet, say I. You, in your role of tax assessor, explain to me that eating tax is not a not the way to achieve my goal. Your assumption is that I want more iron in my diet in order to regain my health and restore roses to my cheeks. Unquestioned in your intervention would be that health is good and that iron a constituent of health. The end is thus left untouched by your criticism. This is a key point. This is precisely, I think, what the Critical Drinker, as well as many others who criticize wokeness in media, are doing. <clears throat> they are 
pointing out that if the woke storytellers are attempting to convey a message, again, the, the message, message, if you will, in their, uh, in their media, in their storytelling, that they're doing it poorly. Now, of course, they're right. Almost all woke media that we can criticize as being woke, <clears throat> the message gets in the way of the storytelling. And that's a problem, right? Because it produces poorly written stories with problems and plot holes and contrivances and, and all sorts of all sorts of literary issues, specifically literary issues. And so, of course, this is subject to criticism. However, the problem is that a lot of these critics will go on to say, if the media were good, if the stories were well written, I wouldn't have such a problem with it. That is where I think we go a step too far. McInerney continues. Of course, I might have responded to your question with a sigh, given you an abbreviated account of my recent travails, and said that I wanted to shuffle off this mortal coil. The internal hemorrhaging promised by the consumption of a bowl of carpet tax seemed to my troubled mind an effective way to achieve my end. What would you say to that? This raises the question of what can we say to someone whose ends or whose goals are incorrect, inappropriate, wrong. Certainly we can say something. Certainly we ought to say something. If we come across someone contemplating self-deletion, we ought to certainly uh, discourage them from uh, the act. Certainly, I think. This should be uncontroversial in the field of ethics. However, if it is the end goal to which they are striving, and they have chosen a particular means to ensure their, uh, their imminent demise, and that means would be effective in ensuring it, the reasoning we've just gone through would dictate that we have no way of criticizing them. We'd have to say that, no, your means of eating a bowl of carpet tax seems quite effective towards the end you have selected. And since it is the end you've selected, it is not my business to, uh, to criticize anything further. Now, this is, of course, equivalent to saying that, well, someone, if someone were to somehow write a, uh, a leftist story, woke story, or, or something with what we would call the message, that's well written from a technical standpoint, that we, as, uh, well, cultural critics, more so than philosophers such as myself, but that, but that uh, traditional, more traditional-minded cultural critics would have nothing to criticize. They would have no way of saying that, no, this is incorrect, this is the wrong kind of story, there's something wrong going on here. That you shouldn't have these dastardly messages embedded in your media. We'd have nothing to criticize. We couldn't because, well, it's well put together. It's a good story, and they've told it well as far as it goes. I, of course, would, would argue that it's, in fact, not a good story simply because of its message. It's not... It, they're not bad caused by in, in, uh, inserting the message where it doesn't belong, but rather... That's true, but then beyond that, they're also bad because they have a bad message. We can criticize what they are trying to do more than just criticizing how they're doing it. And we also, we absolutely should. Failure to do so is, I would argue, a failure to properly criticize the media that we're taking in and the media that we're examining. Now, I'm no professional critic again, and I probably couldn't get away with being a professional critic with, such, with standards such as these, but I'm a philosopher, so to hell with those standards. I'm here to point out that we can, we, and we often do criticize such ends. In the case of someone hypothetically eating a bowl of carpet tax, we certainly would criticize their, uh, their decision to shuffle off this mortal coil. We would try to, desperately to discourage them from doing so. Why should we not similarly try desperately to, to discourage people from infecting media, even good media, with poor messaging. All right, well, maybe, maybe the purpose of media, or the purpose of storytelling, or the purpose of filmmaking or writing, or whatever, you, whatever it might be, is not therefore subject to this kind of a criticism. Maybe the point of media is to express the views of the writer in some way. Maybe it is something, uh, maybe we are judging or having to judge by a standard of authenticity. And if we have a, uh, a 
woke, so to speak. Um, writer, we should, of course, expect a woke story, or at least a uh, a modernist or postmodernist or leftist narrative. This assumes that people, of course, this being a silly assumption, this assumes that people cannot be wrong in their worldview. They certainly can. They often are. Almost always, actually. Most people are wrong about at least some things in their worldview. And, of course, that because they can't particularly be wrong in their worldview, this assumption goes further to say that that worldview cannot and should not be criticized. It can only be not even disagreed with, but rather counteracted with another competing worldview that I might put forward rather than what you put forward. This isn't even really disagreement so much as pushing at one another, which is really a form of intellectual disrespect, if you ask me. And if you're watching this video, you probably have asked me for that matter, so there you are. So what we have to really ultimately ask is, what is the purpose of telling a story? What are we trying to do when we tell a story? This is the fundamental way of figuring out whether we're doing something good or something bad per natural law theory, which is McInerney's uh, position, following Aquinas, following Aristotle, following basically the entirety of the Western tradition with a small period post-1500 accepted. Now, a story in this context is meant to convey something. It's meant to tell the audience something. In that sense, it is an act of communication. Now, if we go to uh, to ask what is the purpose of communication, it's to convey information. And that information, if it is to be conveyed, ought to be true. It doesn't just, a story or a, or a speech act or anything, it does not just convey some information, it conveys true information. It is a worse speech act or a worse story if it conveys something false. Now, this might seem to eliminate storytelling at all from the realm of the ethical, since, of course, stories are, by and large, fictional. But we should remember that the message of a story, the information meant to be conveyed by a fictional story, is not, say, these events actually occurred. If we're talking about, uh, say, uh, to use an example that the Critical Drinker has, uh, using, uh, say, an episode of Star Trek, this is not to tell us that this is what is going to happen to certain humans in several hundred years. Rather, say, uh, an episode like The Drumhead, again, something that, uh, that The Drinker has referenced and many other authors have referenced as well, as being an excellent, excellent philosophical episode of television. And I would, of course, agree. It's not trying to tell the viewer that this is, in fact, what will happen in a few hundred years. Rather, it's trying to tell the viewer something about principles of uh, of law, principles of ethics, principles of uh, ideas about uh, criticizing viewpoint censorship and, and paranoia and all of these more fundamental themes. That's what the story is intending to convey. It's not just trying to say something about a person named uh, a, a Frenchman named Jean-Luc Picard with a, an English accent in uh, you know 400 years hence who shall perhaps do something that that's not the idea that's not what it's trying to convey if you are watching fiction or listening to fiction or reading a fictional story and you're interpreting it as if it were an account of news you are misunderstanding the medium just like if I were to use an analogy and you misunderstood the analogy, you would have misunderstood what I was trying to say. If I were to say, for example, uh, it is as cold as death in here, and you were to ask me, well, just how cold is death? Isn't that just ambient room temperature, absent biorhythm, or something silly like that? I would obviously think that you've misunderstood <laughs> Because you have, you've misunderstood what I was trying to convey, that it is quite cold in here, right? I've, I've used a metaphor to explain something using something like colorful language. I could just as easily say that it's so and so many degrees and mean just roughly the same thing, although with an added bit of, uh, of an added bit of trying to convey the subjective so that we can share something, uh, something that's uh, more sentimental. 
And this is what a story does. It captures the imagination, it captures the understanding, so that we can understand something together through something that isn't quite literally true. But it's saying something true. Even if the words that are used are not themselves true, or the setting that it's portraying is not exactly real, it's a representation of reality. And that is what stories are trying to do. That is what they are meant to do. And if they fail to do that, if they fail to represent reality properly, or if they try to convey some message that is false, they fail as stories. They don't do the job that they are intending to do correctly. The bad. Not just ethically, but technically as well. Let's take an analogy. If you had someone who, uh, say, a baseball player, uh, he is an excellent batter, perhaps. Every time in his entire career that he has been up to bat, he has never once struck out. In fact, he's never once hit a strike. Never. But every time, absolutely every time he goes up to bat, he hits a fly ball, that is caught by the opposing team. He's never made a run. He's never even made it to first base. Would you call him a good baseball player? I certainly wouldn't. He's not playing the role that he takes within the game. He might be an excellent hitter. He might be able to hit the ball with incredible consistency. But he can't make a run, which is the point of the game. Similarly, if, if a woke storyteller could manage to tell an incredible story with deep, deep, wrong meaning, say, for example, let's take the example of the drumhead, the example of uh, the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Say a woke writer were to rewrite such an episode in defense of, say, um, uh, paranoid, tyrannical censorship and uh, and mock trials and, and uh, kangaroo courts and such. And Picard's speech at the end were in defense of such things, rather than... You know, there are some words I've known since I was a schoolboy. But the first link the chain is forged, the first speech censured, the first thought forbidden, the first freedom denied, chains us all irrevocably. First time any man's freedom is trodden on, we're all damaged. Were that the case, I think that the story would be worse. In fact, I think it would be terrible. Because if it were particularly well done from a technical standpoint, then it would be far worse than such a story, a woke story that is told poorly from a technical standpoint, that doesn't convey its message well. If it conveys its message well, convincingly even, but it conveys the wrong message, that is a worse story than one that attempts to convey a false message and fails. So all this is to say that when we criticize things, or when we examine any situation ethically, it's not enough to merely criticize the, the means of achieving some end. The technical aspects of how well is something done? Is it executed well? But rather, we also have to criticize, or at least if we're going to take the medium seriously, we have to criticize whether it is doing what it ought to be doing and doing it well. There are both of these aspects. Without both of them working together, we're not actually taking the medium seriously. We're not treating stories as if they were important. And since this is a, uh, a response video to The Critical Drinker, I know, certainly, that he takes stories seriously. Again, you if you're familiar with his work, which I hope you are, uh, you, you'll be familiar with a lot of his, his, again, very inspiring videos about the importance of storytelling. Historically, culturally, all of this. I'll put some in the in the description below if you have it. If you're not familiar with them, again, 
I can't recommend them highly enough because they're excellent. But this is a point where I think he misses that. Because we're so we're so conditioned by by modernity and this this idea that we we have ends that are merely subjectively selected and that we don't take disagreements about first principles or about worldviews the least bit seriously. And so it shouldn't be a means of critique. I think it should. I think we should take our stories seriously. I think we should take each other seriously and really not just argue and butt heads about things, but really disagree. Talk about it. Think about what we should be saying, not just how we say it. So hopefully this has been something to consider, and hopefully this is something that really will, I, th I hope, I can only hope, catch on in terms of media criticism. This is something that maybe we can, we can work on moving forward. People who are much better at this sort of thing than I am can start really criticizing not just how something is done, but what's being attempted. Anyway, thank you for hearing me out. I'm Professor McCoy, and I'll see you next time.